Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this webinar on the Eucharistic Revival. My name is Dan Salucci. I have the privilege of serving as the CEO of Catholic Leadership Institute, but in this capacity, I'm really blessed to be serving on one of the subcommittees for the Eucharistic Revival, the Leadership Subcommittee, and I'm gonna be your MC and facilitator uh, for this webinar today. So, so grateful to have everybody joining us uh, and grateful to have your expertise and your wisdom be a part of this second webinar, uh, preparing for Corpus Christi uh, and the launch of the Eucharistic Revival, a practical guide for your diocesan celebration of the feast. Um, just before we begin, maybe just a few housekeeping items. We would love to know where you're um, uh, coming in from. So if you can put your the name of your diocese in the chat bar, that's always fun to see where we're uh, represented from and grateful to have so many dioceses represented uh, in, this, uh, in this webinar today. Um, we are recording this webinar so that we can uh, watch it again or you can share it with others in your diocese or uh, other colleagues in ministry around the country. And we will have plenty of time with our awesome uh, group of panelists uh, to dig into questions and answers. And so we're gonna encourage you to put those questions in the question bar um, so that we can uh, attend to as many as possible in the time that we have. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Father Dan at Hamley at the um, Bishop's Conference, uh, and he is gonna lead us in prayer today. So Father Dan, over to you. Thank you so much, Dan. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for being here. It's a real blessing to join you on this uh, great endeavor that our bishops have called us to help them uh, revive uh, faith in our Eucharistic Lord. It's a privilege for us to be part of this. I want to begin with uh, prayer and reflection uh, to kind of set us on the right course, especially in this Easter season. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hear from St. Luke in his book of the gospel an account of jesus risen while they were still speaking that is uh, the disciples from emmaus jesus stood in their midst and said to them peace be with you but they were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost then he said to them why are you troubled and why do you questions arise in your hearts look at my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. And as he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. It's good for us during the Easter season to, to reflect upon the Eucharist in a particular way, to realize that we receive the risen Lord when we receive Jesus in the Eucharist. We, we, uh, we rightly uh, talk about the holy sacrifice of the Mass, that the one sacrifice on Calvary is re-present on the altar at every Mass. And in a sense, every time we encounter Jesus' Eucharistic presence, there's an encounter with the Paschal mystery that's taking place there. Especially, it's always been thought of theologically, we understand that under the two species, the appearance of bread, the appearance of wine, and in, which symbolizes the separation of the blood from the body of Christ in his sacrifice on the cross, and especially when his side was pierced, but even before that, in all of his wounds, uh, that we have uh, a representation or an indication uh, of the power and presence of representation of the, of the holy sacrifice of Christ. But, but we realize that, that when we come into the Eucharistic presence of the Lord and we worship and adore him, and when we receive him uh, at Mass, at Holy Mass, or, you know, a sick person at home, we're receiving uh, the, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of a glorified, risen Lord who sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven now. You know, as we encounter him, he comes to us and joins us where we are on earth. But we have to realize that if we really are entering into his life in a deeper way every time we receive the Eucharist and every time we encounter him and worship him and visit him in the Eucharist, we also have to realize that like, he's taking us where he is. He's meeting us where we are, but he takes us where he is, which means he takes us to heaven <laughs> at the right hand of the Father. That's a really beautiful thing to realize uh, that, that we hope in heaven 
And when we come to the Eucharist, of course, with faith, believing, but then with hope, desiring heaven, desiring that full and final happiness, a union with God in heaven, that there's an aspect in which that hope itself has a kind of realization in our union with Jesus and in our prayer uh, with him. It's just good for us to kind of think about that, that, that we, we, we should be looking forward to heaven. We also realize that we taste heaven in the Eucharist. Um, and, and, and that should fill us with a lot of strength and joy. And there's lots of ways we can contemplate that. But I want to propose a, a particular way, a particular aspect of Jesus and his glory that we can enter into and participate and, and make a part of our life and, and hopefully bring others to kind of realize that in their own life. Um, we have this account of, of the resurrection. There's all these accounts of the resurrection. And it's beautiful for us to use our imagination and kind of enter into these accounts. Because, you, you know, thinking about it, like probably Jesus appears to, the, to these guys uh, who were huddled together, most likely in the same room they did the Last Supper, not but 50, 55 hours after uh, the, the, the de Christ's death on the cross. Uh, and not long after they all bolted from him, very like late night or early morning on, on Good Friday, you know, like at 2, 2 a.m. in the middle of the night in the garden, when they all kind of left him and Peter denied him. And, um, and, and the, the whole thing, and then, and then you think about the, the, what they went through, the trauma they went through of, it, for those like John, who actually saw the crucifixion, maybe some others heard it and saw it from a distance, um, and for all the people that were present there, Mary Magdalene, Our Lady, Mary, Our Mother, and um, all those people, when they look and think about that, the crucifixion, where they are at that moment, what's seared into their minds about the crucifixion. And, and it, you know, crucifixion was the most horrible thing you could think of. Um, and, and the one they loved uh, had just had it happen to him. And, and they witnessed it. And there was so many different, like, aspects of pain. There's disappointment. There, there's disappointment in themselves. There's just, just the, the, the whole horror of, of seeing someone they love tortured and, and rejected and reviled. And I guess a, a good way to put it is like, there's no way at that moment they can conceive how this thing could ever be considered something good. There's just no way. Uh, at best, they might hope that some of the edge of the pain and sadness that they have could be taken off. And then you have these scenes and these various scenes that are that are painted by the gospel writers. I just picked Luke kind of uh, as one uh, where our Lord comes to them. And you can just see the whole the whole joy of the resurrection overflows the sadness. We see that best probably in Mary Magdalene when she meets with our Lord outside the tomb and the joy that she feels at that moment, which before she was just almost inconsolable at even thinking now it's bad enough. He got killed. Now we lost his body. And then suddenly it's him. And we and and that joy kind of echoes throughout the centuries. We see it in the Acts of the Apostles, where where these all of these people, but especially these apostles who had fled now, are just full of joy and able to preach the gospel with just tremendous power and courage. And, and so we see that, and it's and it's really being powered by the joy of the resurrection throughout their life. And and we kind of we've received that even to this day, two thousand years later, the echo of that joy is with us. But there's one aspect which really is good for us to reflect upon. Our Lord shows them his hands and his feet. As it's recorded by Luke, it's recorded by John. Both of them, both of them like record this, and that's all in all their minds. That our Lord bears the sacred wounds still. It, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing because, of course, he, he by his power as God, he rose from the dead, and he could have closed his hands up and made them as smooth as babies' hands and has closed his feet up and closed his side up again. He could have done that if he wanted. He, he, he was completely sovereign. He had the power to do that, but he chose to keep the wounds. And not only that, the wounds uh, now ha have a completely different meaning, a new meaning. They show his triumph. They show his victory. And in fact, he, he invites him, look, look at this. It's me. Yes, I was nailed to the cross. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. Uh, there are nail marks in it, but now they're, 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 they show my triumph. They show my love for you, of course, which was revealed by my giving myself on the cross. But now they show the, the, the fact that the worst the world can dish out, I can turn into joy and triumph. Think about that. In his person, he turns the worst the world can dish out into joy and triumph. 
that's that's you know an aspect of the resurrection that each of us need to appropriate and open our lives to uh, and that's an that's that's precisely part of what we receive in the eucharist it's our lord it's our lord with his glorified wounds which are now trophies of his victory uh, that we receive and in union with him and in entering into union with him we can we can kind of reconceive of of aspects of our life in some ways but even more than that we can realize like okay I, I don't see how some things that i've experienced in my life and i've seen other people experience i just don't see how how those can be made good i don't i don't i don't see it but of course those people on good friday didn't didn't see how that could be made good either and there's an aspect that this is a mystery bathed in the light of heaven but we look forward to the day when our lord we will be able to make all things right. All tears will be wiped away, and we look to that. We look to that day uh, w when it will come, and, and even in just looking that and, and exercising that hope in our hearts for what our Lord can do, and trusting Him that He will do it, as we receive Him in the Eucharist, as we pray to Him in the Eucharist, as we do that, even here and now, we get a little consolation, <laughs> we get a little foretaste, and, and we get the peace that comes with that peace that comes with, with what he will do. And so this season, and as we, as we proceed in our work, let's, let's remember that this is what the world needs. The world needs hope. And this is exactly the hope that we need. Our Lord is offering it to us in the Eucharist as he waits in the tabernacle and the Adoration Chapel, and especially as he gives himself to us at every Mass when we receive him. And, and, and we need to pray and open ourselves to this and so we just end with this prayer. Lord Jesus, you unite us with the glory of your resurrection and the gift of your body and blood in the Eucharist. Grant, we pray, that we may look forward in hope to the time when you will transform all sorrow into joy and experience now as we make our way through life a portion of the happiness and healing of the resurrection. We ask this of you who live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father Dan, thanks so much for that beautiful reflection and prayer. And my uh, son will be making his first Holy Communion next Sunday. And I, I'm going to use the uh, Taste of Heaven uh, language because I think that's just really beautiful for all of us uh, to remember. Um, so just to, to, you got to get connected with me at the beginning, Dan Salucci from Catholic Leadership Institute and on the leadership subcommittee, uh, Father Dan Hanley, um, who, who just led us in prayer and reflection, is the Associate Director for the Secretariat of Clergy, Consecrated Life and Vocations at the Bishops' Conference, uh, and is the, the chairperson of that subcommittee. We're also joined uh, today with Damian O'Connor, excuse me, Robert Naden from the Knights of Columbus, uh, Robert is uh, joining us uh, there. That's the right picture, wrong name, but um, and, and right title, Director of Catholic Information Service at the Knights. Robert's going to be sharing with us some resources. And Father Dustin Doubt, uh, the Associate Director for the Secretariat of Divine Worship uh, from the Bishops' Conference as well, who will be sharing a little bit more context around Corpus Christi uh, in particular. Uh, we are also going to be blessed uh, with a wonderful panelist. Um, we wanted to make sure uh, that many of you who I'm sure have, have organized uh, Corpus Christi processions and, and other large scale diocesan events in the past, you have uh, lots of wisdom and expertise to share. And I think sometimes it's best to uh, have the wisdom from the community be what really leads us. And so today we have a, a couple wisdom figures, a wonderful disciples from dioceses of different shapes and, and sizes. So we have Liz Katropi from uh, the Archdiocese of Boston, who is just a, a few short weeks away from a big uh, Eucharistic gathering there in the Archdiocese. She is the Director of Family Life and Ecclesial Movements. Uh, Father Sean Prince uh, hopefully will be joining us from the Diocese of Richmond, who has helped plan um, Eucharistic processions uh, there in his home diocese. And also uh, Father John Grant from the Diocese of Tulsa. He is the Director of Office of Divine Worship. So just some different, different voices, different perspectives that could help us think through some of our preparations uh, as we gear up for Corpus Christi and the start of uh, the diocesan year in the Eucharistic revival. 
in our last webinar, if you were able to join or even if you weren't, I, I, there were a couple of kind of key things about the revival that were shared. And I just wanted to touch on them briefly to make sure as, as Father Dan led us in his reflection, this is, um, this is a moment. Uh, this is meant to be um, uh, a, a moment of conversion and encounter uh, for the whole church in the United States around the deep sacredness of the Eucharist. And so I think just like Sunday Mass, we can become maybe formulaic or, or kind of habitual of, uh, in different practices and lose sight of the incredible nature of what we're really talking about. But I think the same is true for as we look at the Eucharistic revival or this Corpus Christi, uh, you know, something that we do every year, but, but maybe this year to just maybe take a step back and really consider the awe and wonder of what the Lord has gifted us with. Um, and so our theme, again, for the revival, My Flesh for the Life of the World, uh, from John there, just something to keep in our hearts and at the forefront of our planning. Uh, very clear mission and vision here to renew the church by enkindling a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist. Uh, and we really see this as a movement uh, across the United States uh, to heal, converted, formed, and unified by encounter with Jesus in the Eucharist. So again, um, we can we can get into our planning modes as, as folks in, in diocesan or parish life and maybe lose sight a little bit of the big picture, but it's really important to keep this uh, at the forefront. There are uh, five strategic pillars that uh, have been outlined uh, by the Bishop's Conference around the Eucharistic Revival uh, to foster encounters with Jesus through kergamatic proclamation and experiences of Eucharistic devotion, to contemplate and proclaim the doctrine of the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist through the truth of our teaching, to empower grassroots creativity by partnering with movements, uh, apostolates, parishes, and educational in institutions. So really the whole universal church here in the US to make sure that we're all a, a part of this wonderful moment. Uh, and to reach the smallest unit, parish, small groups, and families, to really make sure that this love of the Eucharist and, and this gift that we have is, is being imbued everywhere, especially in the domestic church. And to embrace and learn from the various rich intercultural Eucharistic traditions. So, so many different beautiful ways uh, throughout our tapestry of, of cultures here in the United States that we want to lift up as part of the revival. And we'll look at our timeline at a high level just once again. So phase one, uh, early 22, uh, 2022 to a few short weeks away, June 19th, Corpus Christi. That is meant to be the diocesan period of preparation and getting ready for the launch of the revival. We are quickly approaching phase two that we're going to be talking about uh, the start of in this webinar. Um, the, the diocesan year of the revival to be followed by phase three in 2023 and 2024 uh, of the parish year. So again, trying to get to that smallest unit uh, that we talked about in our strategic pillars. And lastly, culminating in phase four as really not the end, but the, the commissioning, if you will, um, of a national Eucharistic revival event and missionary sending uh, there in, in 2024, 2025. Um, so again, just to keep in mind this big picture that we're all blessed to be a part of um, in the church at this moment in history. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Father Dustin um, Doubt, who's uh, again with the Bishop's Conference, and he's going to just give us a little bit of context around this feast that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we'll be doing some, some nitty gritty nuts and bolts conversation today, but uh, again, to keep the big picture, uh, Father Dustin, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, Corpus Christi? Good afternoon. It's a, a joy to be here uh, with all of you today. Thank you for your, your hard work that you're doing uh, in your dioceses to, uh, to promote the Eucharistic uh, revival. Uh, we know that the, uh, the source uh, and the summit of our faith uh, is uh, the Eucharist, the source uh, from which all of our life flows uh, like uh, a fountain. Uh, and it's the summit, the, 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 the peak to which all of our life is directed. So all of our life from the Eucharist and all of our life toward uh, the Eucharist. Uh, we also know uh, that the, uh, the heart of that, the way that we, um, we live that uh, is in the uh, sacrifice of the Mass, the Eucharistic uh, celebration where we participate uh, in Jesus Christ's sacrifice of himself uh, to uh, the Father. Uh, the Holy Spirit gathers us, gathers the church, makes us uh, Christ's body, and there as members of his body we offer uh, praise uh, to our Heavenly Father. Eucharistic processions are an extension of that. 
Uh, so with the Eucharistic procession, in a certain sense, we carry uh, the Mass, we carry uh, the Eucharist, we carry Christ and His offering to the Father, we carry that out into our communities, out into our world. Um, so I'd like to look at, um, at a, you know, to, to, to look at our, our processions in, uh, in that um, lens. Uh, the Mass itself, we can sort of understand the procession, the Eucharistic procession, it, it, it follows the Mass. So we have the celebration of the Mass and that Eucharistic procession follows it. We can understand that procession that follows it, I think, uh, in light of processions that begin it. We've just uh, celebrated the Paschal Vigil, the, the Easter Triduum, and there is one moment there, and, and actually two when we think of Holy Week where the Mass begins with a procession. So on Palm Sunday and at the Easter Vigil, the church begins outside and processes uh, in common uh, into the church building. It's just a sign of what happens at, at the beginning of the liturgy, um, that the Lord takes us, you know, time, history, need requires that we separate. But the Lord, by His Spirit, brings us together makes us the church, and we as the church enter the building to offer the Eucharist, this mystery of unity, and we don't experience that, you know, at the beginning of every liturgy, you know, when we're seated in the pew and we see the ministers come in, but that's what that is a symbol of. When the when the ministers enter the church building in procession for the, the beginning of the Eucharist, that's a symbol to us of God bringing men and women together in unity for his worship. Uh, he's the one that starts that. He's the one that begins it. He's the one uh, that brings it about. So I think in that light, we can sort of see, uh, we can interpret the procession that happens at the end. Uh, the procession at the end of the Eucharist, what God has done and what he desires to bring people to we express that uh, in, uh, you know, in, in carrying uh, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the community. There's, uh, there's a procession, even when there's a procession at the end of every Mass, we think of the dismissal at Mass. When we pray for, you know, we've received our Lord in Holy Communion, we in a sense have become tabernacles. We pray for the fruits of Holy Communion, and the deacon, you know, declares, go forth, the Mass is ended, go and announce the gospel of the Lord, go forth, you know, glorifying the Lord uh, by your life. And that procession, when we leave the church building, we do that. We as living tabernacles go out into the world, um, you know, the Eucharist still in us that we have consumed, we go forth to bring the Lord's sacrifice to our homes, to our workplaces, to our communities. So those two processions, the Lord gathering people for his worship, and then the Lord sending forth those who have, have worshipped him uh, to transform the world. Uh, we do that in a special way uh, in Eucharistic processions, when we carry forth um, the Lord in, in the monstrance in the Blessed Sacrament, so that that mission of uniting, of becoming the church, united in worship, and that and that and that sign of going forth in in mission. I think that's that's at the heart. You know, worship mission. That sort of um, I think when we th when we think of big picture, uh, those are some of the things uh, that we think about. Um, I also think of you know it's just it's it's also sort of in the same lens. It's a acknowledgement that what we do in the church building is not a private thing. It's not something that's meant to stay within these four walls, but it's something that's meant, you know, to bubble out. I think of that image, it's an Easter image uh, from Ezekiel. You, we see water flowing from the temple, that as that water flows and gets higher and higher, ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, man, I can't even swim in it. You know, that that is something that's happening, that this Eucharist, our Eucharistic Lord, um, is overflowing those four walls. Um, 
and the Lord, uh, you know, desires us uh, to be a part of that uh, with him. Um, I'm sort of, you know, I'm looking over some notes here to see, see whether there's any any other insights, uh, you know, uh, uh, that I would like to share. Um, but yeah, that's really what it is. You know, it, another image I think that we can think of when we think about um, Eucharistic processions and is to think of the merciful father from the parable of the prodigal son. So in the parable of the prodigal son, you know, the, the, the son has wandered off, he comes to his senses, but it's the father who sees him. So a long way off, the father sees him. So the father's been looking for him day after day after day, hoping that he would return. And finally he returns and he doesn't say to his son, hey, you come to me. No, he runs out to his father and the son can barely get out a few words of apology. And there he is embracing his son. And the church really does imitate our merciful father in Eucharistic processions. She doesn't say, hey, world, come to me, meet me on my terms, you know. No, she says, I, I'm coming to you, you know, um, and I'm going to bring you to what you were created for. I am going to bring you to what you long for. I'm going to bring you to the Father who wants you and who has been looking for you every day. Um, so I think that's another helpful image. So I guess just to sort of recap, the processions that begin the liturgy, the church becoming one, made one by the Spirit, part of Christ's body to worship the Father. The church goes forth from every Mass in mission. Uh, and in Eucharistic processions, uh, we do that uh, in sort of a, a visible way. We do that in a unique, special way by carrying our Eucharistic Lord. And I think another image for that. Um, is the merciful father from the uh, the par parable of the, the prodigal son. So that's uh, a few thoughts for us as we get into the nitty gritty, as we get into the practical stuff. Um, again, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for your, uh, your dedication to this holy work. Thank you so much, Father Dustin. Really good, good images to keep in mind as we kind of get into some of the nuts and bolts of the planning. And so you're looking at this image maybe on your screen and you're saying, my goodness, that is a huge, huge uh, procession. Uh, look at the at the size uh, of that canopy and and that monstrance. That must be in a big place. Uh, that is in in tiny diocese of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, and so, Father uh, John Grant always reminds me that it doesn't uh, matter where you're from. You can do great things wherever you are in in honor of our Lord. And so, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, as I uh, mentioned, I, I am not a, a theologian or a, a liturgist. I am a planner, and so I am acutely aware, as I'm sure you are even more so, uh, that we're just about shy of 60 days away from Corpus Christi, and so that might fill you with great excitement uh, today. It might fill you with a little bit of anxiety, but hopefully what we want to try to do is offer some thoughts and, and tips uh, for you as you're entering into that home stretch for Corpus Christi, but also looking beyond Corpus Christi. And so again, I, I spoke with some of our panelists, tried to get some tips and thoughts uh, along a milestone uh, timeline that we're going to go through in just a moment. And then we're going to go to our panel and really ask them for some any insights or, or tips that they might have. Um, so, uh, but to, to just start, and again, remember this, this was a, another gift from Father John Grant. Uh, you know, I love this line that he shared with me from uh, the Corpus Christi sequence. Bring him all the praise you know he is more than you bestow, never can you reach his due. And so I think the way that Father Grant maybe paraphrased it for me was, we should do all that we can with this procession, but it'll still never be enough. And I, I found that very kind of liberating in the sense um, and, and encouraging to remember what we are about uh, when we're talking about this procession. So I, I'm grateful to, to Father Grant for that, that insight that is a part of the sequence um, that we're preparing for. So we wanted to talk a little bit about some key milestones between now and Corpus Christi, uh, learning and insights, again, from the mission field, resources available, and then thinking beyond. Again, this is the start um, of, of, a, of a year for the diocese um, in, in this Eucharistic revival. So uh, by now or as soon as possible, just 10 things that uh, the, the, the folks on the line and others that I talked to who have done this before said so probably want to be thinking of. So determining your procession date and time, really thinking about 
weather um, and heat. Uh, again, in, in the Diocese of Tulsa, they do their procession, I believe, Thursday evening, both so that pastors can be with their communities and do a procession on Sunday, uh, but also in the evening because of uh, the temperature in June in Tulsa. And so just some factors to be thinking of, but you definitely want to be nailing that date and time down. Um, you want to be defining your procession route. One of the things we'll talk about with the panelists today are uh, beginning and ending in different places, perhaps, um, stational altars, uh, what's going to happen in, along the way. Um, depending on where you are in the country and, and what you uh, might be thinking about, it's definitely time uh, to request per, uh, procession permit uh, and police accompaniment if necessary. So depending on your jurisdiction, probably eight weeks is about the amount of time that you need. Sometimes it has to go before a city council or a, a borough council. So you want to make sure that you're lead, uh, leaving enough uh, prep time for that. Um, determining any act after events or activities um, after the procession. So depending on where people may end up in the procession, what is uh, what are the plans there for any continued celebration um, or gathering? You want to be looking for, and we'll talk about this with our, our panelists, you want to be talk, looking for key volunteers or what, what I heard from our friends as parishes with passion. There may be some a few parishes in your diocese that really, really are so excited about this and they can be a wonderful source of volunteers um, and arms and, and feet uh, for this procession and this celebration as well as throughout the year. Uh, making sure to send a save the date ad for the bulletin or the di diocesan magazine once you've locked in on those procession date and time uh, and route. You also want to be thinking about what advisory board or council meetings are already on the calendar and making sure that those folks are being briefed on what uh, the plans are and asking them for help or volunteer names uh, so that they can be ambassadors uh, to help invite people to this. Uh, you also would want to consider uh, inviting your pastors to invite a delegation from each parish to be present for the procession. Uh, and as nitty gritty as we can get, there's got to be maybe some t-shirts or safety vests that might have to be ordered by now. Uh, so if you want people to be kind of marked along the way so that it, it creates some of that root feel, uh, that now would be the time to be thinking about that. And uh, Father uh, Prince brought this up um, in our conversation, just that you know, uh, we now have, um, uh, you know, an expectation and, and good, uh, bad, or indifferent around live streaming things. So is, is this something that is going to be live streamed so that more people can, uh, can, can be aware that it's happening, that it can flood social media with awareness of, of the Eucharist and, um, and therefore, you know, especially for a moving event, um, both moving emotionally and moving physically, you're going to want to make sure that there are proper live stream uh, technology in place and what, what are some of the plans around that. So that's really now about eight weeks out, uh, 60 days or so to go. Some of the, the top considerations that you want to be thinking of that we came up with. If we look at maybe an, another milestone, the Ascension um, on May 26th, uh, by then you're going to want to have con confirmed any con celebrants, uh, servers, first communicants who might be in the procession and, and those other key volunteers. You want to get those volunteers and, and those uh, participants, uh, key participants, to have holding on their time, a, a time for practice, probably the week of the procession. Confirming the music and musicians along the route. How do you plan to do that? Are you going to be using chant? Are you going to be having different uh, choirs along the way? You'll certainly want to lock in on any um, uh, plans for inclement weather. And so just knowing what those are and, and praying that that doesn't happen for sure. And, and by the end of May, folks, we're going to suggest that you might want to be thinking about what's the next invitation that's going to be offered to people who do participate in the procession. Again, keeping in mind that this is meant to be a year revival, you may not be all the way done with your planning for the, for the year's activities, but hopefully you have maybe the first one or two or three activities or, or events or gatherings that may be taking place in the diocese following uh, the Corpus Christi pr procession over the summer or into the fall. And you want to start getting the word out about those as soon as possible. Also, about a month out, you're going to want to be uh, beginning any widespread distribution of promotional materials, perhaps an invitation video from the bishop, uh, posters, postcards, whatever uh, you're thinking of by way of promotional materials. And then again, as a way to, uh, Liz brought this up, as a way to really uh, take advantage of our mobile um, society that people may have a smartphone that they can um, follow the procession in the sense of 
uh, the, the, the aid, the, the worship aid, the procession aid, the songs that you might be um, singing, the, the prayers that you might be offering. You might just be able to have a QR code or a link that you can send out so that it limits the amount of things you have to print and allows people who are more comfortable using their mobile device to do so. Also, you want to make sure you have the ability to share the, the fruits of this event beyond the event. So having uh, photographers, videographers, uh, different people kind of uh, identified and, and placed along the way to make sure that we can continue this celebration in our memories of, of the procession as well. And then throughout, uh, I think this was really um, uh, resonated from all the folks that I talked to who've been involved that prayer makes a difference. Uh, so just as we started this webinar with prayer, you really want to make sure that the team that you are working so hard um, of volunteers and, and staff to plan all of these events that you're praying regularly and also inviting people throughout the diocese to help prepare uh, for the procession through perhaps uh, holy hours offered uh, in different places uh, once a week or maybe at the diocesan pastoral center um, just as an opportunity to allow people to be a part of this preparation in prayer. So I want to go to our panelists. Uh, we Again, we have uh, three different dioceses uh, represented here. Um, we have uh, Father John Grant from the Diocese of Tulsa. Uh, we have Liz Katropi from uh, the Archdiocese of Boston. And I knew we had uh, Father Prince. He may have dropped off, but we'll, we'll get him as soon as he comes back. Um, I just want to point some questions uh, to them to start off with. But I would also suggest to you folks um, on the line uh, that if you have questions, put those into the question bar. Um, and if you have one specifically uh, for one of the people in the diocese, uh, you know, feel free to call that out as well. And we'll do our best to get around to all of them. Uh, but maybe just to start, um, you know, Father Grant, um, I, you know, many of the dioceses in this country are more mission dioceses uh, than are maybe large archdioceses. And so the Diocese of Tulsa is all of Eastern Oklahoma, uh, not a small uh, territory there. I, I think maybe just any insights or thoughts you have for other mission dioceses who are preparing a Corpus Christi procession, anything uh, that you've learned or, or figured out in your time of planning that helps to kind of leverage uh, the resources uh, that you have to go further in, in helping this be a great celebration. Well, yeah, we have a large diocese and, and so it's always difficult. The, um, the sea city of Tulsa is certainly not centrally located in our diocese. And so it does, it does impact the participation we get from across the diocese, but still most of the Catholics in our diocese do live in the sea city of Tulsa. So um, we have, we have uh, by God's grace, people from different parishes have volunteered. And um, so we've got, we've gotten some really interesting participation from other parishes. Um, by, you know, we, we do our Corpus Christi procession, our diocesan Corpus Christi procession on the Thursday um, before the, uh, the, the Sunday of Corpus Christi. And um, we focus it on the, on the um, cathedral in order to, you know, kind of fulfill what the, um, uh, what the, uh, the book, you know, Holy Communion, Holy Communion and Worship of the Eucharist outside of Mass, you know, what it says um, uh, in number 102, that it's fitting to hold some kind of public celebration for the entire city at the cathedral church. And so that's what we focus on um, because we, I mean, and we, we leave it to the parishes to um, really focus on doing the Corpus Christi processions on the individual parish level throughout the diocese on Sunday. Yeah. And there's a follow-up question here. Um, just have you found the level, how have you found the level of participation on Thursday evening you know, maybe in comparison to Sunday, um, and and was there anything? Um, and you mentioned kind of leaving it to the parishes on Sunday. I know when we spoke, you said it was really helpful to enable pastors and parishes to participate even more so in Tulsa uh, to do it on Thursday. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was, it's been it's been many years ago now since the since we've done it on Sundays, and on Sundays basically the only participation we got was the cathedral parish. Um, by doing it on Thursday, we were able to invite parishes from throughout the, the city and the, perhaps the diocese to come and participate. And we, we, we've seen greater participation. Um, and, and we've also seen a growing desire amongst individual parishes, especially uh, uh, persons in individual parishes kind of pressuring their pastors to, to do, a, do at least some kind of a procession you know, around their parish or in their neighborhood right around their parish. Usually not quite as elaborate or as um, as uh, large as the one at the cathedral, but um, but it helps kind of um, show people that you know what can be done, and kind of gets people excited to also bring that then also into their individual parishes to 
you know, to, to bring the king in, into their streets, into their neighborhood, to, uh, you know, to have this state visit from the king on high. That's beautiful. Thanks, Father. Liz, let's go to you. And obviously a very little different place in the Archdiocese of Boston, a, a much more densely populated kind of area. You're going to be, if I'm correct, you're going to be starting your procession at the cathedral and then going to a parish uh, or you're starting. Tell me, tell us about your procession route. And, sure. Uh, so, yeah. So thank you for having me, Dan. Um, yeah, we actually are starting from the Sangha Center in Lowell, which is an arena that holds several thousand. Um, we're having a, our Eucharistic Congress on June 18th with the Cardinal. And so we're going to process out of there to a nearby church in Lowell at St. Patrick's. So that's a little bit different, but we couldn't accommodate um, all the people that are coming to the Eucharistic Congress at the cathedral. So we're going to be doing it there. Nice, very nice. And what's the, it's about, a, you said a mile and a half away? It's, or? No, it's actually probably about a little over a half a mile. Okay. Um, so it's not that far. Uh, and it's, it, it, we're going to have police presence. We have a permit from um, the city of Lowell. And they've done this in Lowell before. So they're um, familiar because they just have some wonderful faithful churches up there who, who love their procession. So um, that's made it easier. Great. And uh, Father Prince, if we, we can go to you in, in the Diocese of Richmond, the, the procession route that you have, can you tell us a little bit about how the Diocese of Richmond uh, celebrates Corpus Christi? Uh, we tend to do what was on the, uh, what's been uh, aforementioned, which is uh, leave it up to the individual parishes. One of the challenges that we have here in this diocese as well is very similar to Father John in that um, our diocese takes up sort of the whole bottom half of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so from one end to the other end is a 13 hour drive. Um, so it's it's quite a, a, a vast territory. And so coming together for a central um, gathering, uh, we've always found challenges with that. And oftentimes uh, we're divided in three different vicariates and the vicariates tend to sort of uh, drive those sort of diocesan initiatives. But we have had instances such as our Eucharistic Congress we did in 2020 for our um, bicentennial uh, celebration as a diocese. That's when we had a Eucharistic Congress um, that, uh, excuse me, a, a Eucharistic procession um, on a diocesan level. So I believe that for this year, uh, the practice will be again uh, within the parishes and encouraging whatever each parish uh, desires to do on the local level. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, the uh, what happens along the way on the processional route. And, and so, um, Father John, you, you mentioned uh, the, the uh, presence of stational altars. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what that looks like in, in your um, Corpus Christi procession and, and kind of how that happens or what are some of the important things around uh, making that happen in an effective way? Um, we've tried to have three stational altars in our procession, which our procession is just about, it's kind of, it's a two, it's a two block loop. Uh, so it's not that big, but our procession moves pretty slowly, so um, it does take a while. We usually try to have three stational altars, and we've gotten, thankfully, uh, we've had some some groups involved from different parishes, and um, because of the retreat experiences and whatnot, um, who have volunteered in the past to create the altars. And sometimes they um, they they kind of look maybe a little bit different from each other, but typically, uh, some kind of a table that is, is 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 dressed as an altar and with candles and things of this nature, and um, Sometimes sacred art. Even we have one who, one guy who's an artist who always uh, brings a big, huge, uh, beautiful painting of our Lord, and he, he uses a fence that we kind of do at one spot. With a, there's a fence where he attaches it to the fence. So it, anyway, we just we try our best to make uh, beautiful these beautiful altars, and then we stop at each one, and at each one we, uh, I mean, the the the, doc, the, the, the book doesn't give much uh, direction on what to do at a stational altar except for benediction. And so what we do is we do a reading from scripture, uh, a reading from a sermon from one of the church fathers, and then the bishop says a prayer, and then he gives benediction, and then we, we, we resume the procession again to the next stational altar. And then finally, we'll end up back into the church where we will do final uh, solemn benediction and, um, and conclude. So you're, you, you, um, you do a loop, Father, and, and the nice part about the loop is that it doesn't require uh, moving or transporting people back, especially right. people who might not be able uh, to make the, the trek back who have made the, the procession in the first place. Liz, mm -hmm. your uh, route has uh, people ending up in a different place, but it sounds like uh, about a half a mile might be doable for most people. I'm curious, Liz, uh, stational altars on, on your procession or um, and also 
do you offer transportation or things for people at the end point to come back to where they might have been parked? Um, Sure, we hope to have um, some transportation for those that feel like they cannot uh, get back the half mile, um, but we will not be having altars, transitional altars along the way because they have been in a, the Congress all day and um, and it's already, we're starting at 8.30 and by this time it'll be, you know, 5, 5.30. So uh, we plan on uh, singing um, certain hymns and uh, some certain prayers and then we will end up at St. Patrick's um, for benediction and reposing the sacrament. Thank you. Let, question to all three of you just around music or uh, things that you have found work particularly well in a procession or just maybe ideas or insights you might offer uh, to any of those um, uh, who are listening in around planning music for uh, the procession. Don't we have relied mostly on acapella music, um, singing, and we, you know, we have we have been able to come up with kind of a mobile uh, PA system. Um, and some years we've had uh, some parts of some parts of our groups who wanted to do a lot of like, um, you know, pre-recorded music, which I thought took away from the experience. I didn't like the pre-recorded music. I preferred that we that the voices of the people be what really animated. But we usually try to pick songs that are um, uh, you know, kind of well-known Eucharistic hymns and things like that so people can participate easily. We've always made um, worship aids. I like the idea of maybe trying to use phones uh, to kind of cut down on the number of things we have to print. Uh, that, that's a good idea that I might try this year. We'll see. But um, uh, we also have incorporated litanies or like, you know, a decade of the rosary too. So it's, we, don't, we don't exclusively sing. Great. Liz, how about you and then Father Prince? Sure, we're hoping to have uh, strategically placed um, people that can sing that will help uh, keep the singing going. And it is gonna take um, uh, quite a while to get us all out of the Sangha Center and en route. So we are taking, um, driving over uh, Sarah Kroger, who's gonna be with us from the band uh, Village Lights. And so we're gonna send her over ahead of time. And so as people are approaching, you know, they're going to hear her from that end, but we will have people strategically placed within the line um, and queuing people up and just, yeah, very simple, you know, hymns uh, re repeated over and over and uh, mobile friendly. Um, we'll have it available on their phones. Great. Thanks. I love Sarah Kroger. I'm going to have to come up for that session. <laughs> Father Prince, how about you? Any insights on, on music or uh, other aspects of the, the procession room? Very similar to what Liz mentioned, uh, when we held one on the Dawson level, we uh, strategically placed people and uh, had, you know, various cantors from the cathedral. And every so often we would sort of drop one into the mix so that they could sort of keep uh, keep the singing going. And again, very similar with regard to hymns, more sort of Taze approach in the sense of just a repetitive um, uh, melody or, or <clears throat> um uh, uh, you know, hymn that people knew, um, so that they we didn't have to worry with um, the a worship aid in a sense for people to use um, uh, to cut down on a cost for us. So that was just one of the one of the options. But I, I agree too that it was more a cappella, and it's uh, there seems to be a little more solemnity um, to that rather than pre-recorded uh, music um, or um, others. But again, there we as we all have. Um, various cultural backgrounds um, and dif different uh, cultural groups within the church, uh, that may be something that they are used to and a custom of theirs um, as well. So I, I think making room for that too is important. Yeah. Let me add one last thing. Oh, go ahead, we for the also, yeah. we've been able to invite um, some of the, from our, from our uh, parishes that have speak different languages. So usually we have uh, the, the choir from the Vietnamese church come and they mm -hmm. sing one song. And often that is the kind of thing around one of the stational altars, and same thing with uh, the, the Burmese, and so, and then the English and Spanish kind of back and forth throughout. So um, that's also been really good too, because it, it, it makes the people from that parish want to come, and, um, and it's kind of beautiful to show the kind of the multicultural uh, devotion to, our, to, the, to the Eucharist too. So. And, and so let's uh, maybe before we move to uh, any more questions that come in the question bar, but also uh, Robert Naden is going to just share a little bit uh, with us from the resources. Uh, from the Knights. Um, just maybe a last question for the, the panelists that um, in, in the immediate after, uh, conclusion of the of the procession. So, um, you know, what are some of the 
ideas or activities uh, that you're doing. Certainly, uh, Father Grant, I think if I remember correctly, there are fireworks uh, in, in downtown Tulsa, which is, I just think, really cool. Um, and then, uh, Liz, I'm curious, kind of as you are kind of culminating a, a year of, of the Eucharist with a, a huge Congress, what just ideas, looking back on that, would you offer to those listening around ways to continue on from the procession beyond Corpus Christi? Um, so, Father Grant, maybe for the immediate kind of after after event or after activities, and then Liz, maybe kind of looking at a long-term effort. We um, usually just have cookies and, and water available afterwards for people, and um, the, the, the fireworks is something I've been wanting to get going for years and years. As, as you mentioned earlier, I told you, so our, our motto is sort of do all that you can, and it will never be enough, and so every year we try to do a little bit more and so the fireworks has been my goal for many years. And I think finally this year it's going to happen. I saw when I was at a, Eucharist, a Corpus Christi procession in Mexico, in Guadalajara, and that was like the culmination was fireworks. Uh, they don't have July 4th, so Corpus Christi was like the firework holiday. And um, I thought that would be a beautiful way to celebrate. You know, when you, when you finish the procession, you come out and there's fireworks. So I hope we're going to be able to do that this year. Very nice. Me too. Liz, how about thinking about like a longer term kind of keeping the, the Eucharistic kind of uh, devotion alive for, you know, over a year. What learnings from Boston would you offer to uh, those who are on the line? Sure, yes, because well, when we started this, it came out, um, the pastoral letter from the Cardinal came out in 2019 in December, and then COVID hit soon after. And so we were entering a year of the Eucharist that turned into two years of the Eucharist, <laughs> culminating um, in this Eucharistic Congress, and then the USCCB, um, so aptly announced a Eucharistic revival. So, um, yeah, I think that it's um, one of the things that we're planning on doing is we'll have our Congress on the 18th, and then um, people at their parishes will have their own processions at their local parish the next day. And then each family member who comes to the Eucharistic Congress is going to get something to take this home to the family, the domestic church. So um, and hoping that they'll follow up and and. It's going to be a list of different things that they can do um, that evening uh, um, on the Feast of Corpus Christi, but uh, things to do, put into regular practice um, and, you know, try to connect them to some further resources. But that's our plan at the moment. And I know Jonathan's going to put into the chat just the link to Boston's resources because they've done just a lot of great uh, work in, in kind of leading up to that. But on the question of resources, maybe I can go to Robert. Uh, Nathan at the Knights and and Robert, you you all have put together just some phenomenal resources uh, for everybody. Would you mind just sharing uh, with our folks on the line what you have and and uh, uh, for their for their uh, help in their processions? Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, the Knights of Columbus are honored to support the Eucharistic revival and in any sort of ways that we can. Um, the the way we kn we know that. The way we're going to help the revival the most is by individual knights growing in their own devotion to the Eucharist and deepening their own faith life and um, doing that at the local level. Um, but we also know that we can uh, provide additional resources. And so um, the first thing that we wanted to make available is kind of just a how-to. And uh, this is for anyone and everyone who maybe they've never put on a procession before or they have, but they want to expand it, or they just want to see what what's uh, possible and available. So, uh, we have a Eucharistic procession guidebook available that kind of really covers a lot of the things that we've talked about here today, um, and goes through step by step uh, some of those questions of: Do you start in one church and go to another, or do you go in a loop, or what about stational altars? All of that is. Uh, we, we've tried our best to, to put as much in as possible. Um, for, for you guys who have been a part of processions, you know that the reality is that the liturgical books leave us so much space to adapt it to a local culture and community. Um, and so we've, we've tried not to be too prescriptive with it um, and say this is just some guidance and your procession um, might be in this order or you might move th some people around and uh, do the best you can with that. Um, and then also those additional questions of do you use a microphone or um, where's the choir or um, how are you thinking about not only just getting the nuts and bolts of a procession done, 
but how do you intentionally make this uh, an evangelical moment for your community? Um, and are you praying for your procession and those who are encountering uh, our Eucharistic Lord as you bring him to the streets? Um, so uh, there's, there's a lot in there. Um, in my mind, as we're putting this together, it's perfect for um, a priest who wants to do a procession and wants to get those core volunteers up to speed. Uh, who maybe don't aren't as familiar with the liturgical norms or uh, what's a cope or what's a monstrance, and so this is uh, really meant for get everyone on on the same page. And now we can go and make those decisions as a group, um, and then it it takes a little bit off the priest. Um, in a similar way, we have videos associated with these that basically go through visually uh, all of the the stuff that is uh, included in the procession. Uh, guidebook. Um, and so there's uh, in English and Spanish for both the guidebook and the video. Uh, we've tried to show variety as much as we can. Uh, there's only so much you can do with that. Um, but just to show that there there is a lot open for a community to make it its own. So these the guidebook and the video are available on the Eucharistic Revival website. I, I think John just put it in the chat there. Um, we also have our, uh, specifically for nights, um, resource pages with not only these, but additional, like, this is our time to really dive into our devotion in the Eucharist. So we'll, we'll be adding resources there as well. Um, and we want to make additional resources available. So um, we have, uh, we, we... Oh. That uh, looks like he might have just dropped off, uh, um, but uh, we thank the Knights for that. It does, I think Robert's point, uh, I had not really thought about uh, relative to, uh, you might be well familiar with uh, the way to, to do this, but your, your folks who might be volunteering, this might be the first time. So to give them a resource that helps to form them and engage them. Robert, we lost you, we got you back. So, sorry and, um, about that. No, that's okay. Uh, just I was just saying, I think your point about using those tools as a formational opportunity uh, I think is is really spot on. Um, in, in our last few moments, before I ask uh, Father uh, Dan to, to close us in prayer, um, I'm just wondering to our panelists, Father Grant, uh, Liz, and, and um, Father Prince, uh, thank you so much for, again, for your time and your wisdom. But maybe if you think back to, to the processions that you've planned or that you're planning, um, just the one biggest learning or piece of advice, uh, anything that's on your heart or your mind from your experience that you would say, uh, I just think this is the most important thing that I want to offer right now. Um, you know, give it give it a, a moment's thought and then and then share that with uh, the community gathered. So whoever feels called to go first, Father Prince, do you, do you have yours? Yes, I do. <clears throat> I think um, what I found to be most uh, helpful is definitely uh, pulling everyone together, and even if it's physically walking as much of the space but actually going through it um, do not assume that people understand or have a grasp of what's uh, taking place especially in our experience with us not doing this much on the diocesan level or many parishes doing it it's a first time uh, for many people and other other dioceses and archdioceses may have that similar experience and there's nothing wrong with actually walking through it because in doing so you may actually, as the organizers and someone who's extremely detail-oriented myself and writes everything down, there were a few things that got missed, but when we walked through it, we were prepared for the day of. So um, I can't stress enough rehearsing, practicing, gathering everybody together and making sure everybody's um, on the same page. Pro pro awesome point. Probably the or origination of the walkthrough, if we, <laughs> if we really think about it, right? No more important walkthrough. Uh, excellent, excellent tip, Father Prince. Um, uh, Liz, how about you? Do you have a, just kind of a learning or an insight from all your planning over the last couple of years? Uh, sure, yes. I mean, we have had uh, Walking with Mary, um, where we've had about 2,000 uh, people come out from um, many different communities from all over, which is great. Um, so we have a little experience with this. Uh, this will be our first for the year of the Eucharist, but um, I would say that it definitely one of the things that's helped us is we put out early on, uh, asked parishes to um, bring forth a year of the Eucharist coordinator and then missionaries. 
um, and to get as much buy-in as possible. And then there was a commissioning that the Cardinal did with them. Um, it was over Zoom because it was COVID, but um, to really drum up interest in each parish. So I, I would say that if there's a way to get your vicariate, um, your vicar for rain or your, whoever's in charge of your deanery too on top, on, in addition to those coordinators and missionaries, that would be really important because you want to get as much um, buy-in as possible so that, um, because people are really busy and um, so many things are coming up, but it's really great if um, if the people could come together and really um, just put all of their prayer and uh, their efforts into something so hopeful and beautiful for the church. But I think um, getting representation from out there to help. Good point. And one of the questions we talked about on our subcommittee is that you have, um, you know, we 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 have the the synod that is culminating in many dioceses, and people say, oh well, we're kind of not paying attention yet to this, if you will, but. But think about it maybe a different way. In many cases, you know, here in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, everybody has a synod coordinator at their parish. It's another just opportunity, maybe build on that role or expand uh, some of the folks that we're getting involved. So, uh, and it doesn't have to be a staff member. You know, it could right. be a volunteer, somebody who's passionate about the Eucharist. At, you know, at the parish. Um, right. Yeah. Thanks, Liz. Great point, Father Grant. Last one. Anything that uh, just hasn't been said, or you want to make sure you offer from a, a learning or an insight? Well, I, I, my insight would be that it's okay to start small. You know, I, I, I think doing it is the first step. And, and I, I've already told you that the motto for, for me and for, for our Corpus Christi processions has been do all that you can. You'll, it'll never be enough. So we just try to make it a little bit more every single year. And every single year, more and more people hear about it, more people participate, uh, people get excited, they have ideas, they take it back to their parishes. So um, it, it, don't be afraid just to start with something even simple um, to begin to, you know, make the Eucharist more and more and more and more uh, alive in our dioceses. And, and one day there'll be fireworks, right? <laughs> so Father Grant, uh, Father Prince, and Liz, thank you so much. Father Dustin, I'm going to, we are right at time, two minutes over. If you wouldn't mind uh, closing us in prayer. And before you do that, just folks, uh, we will continue to, to try to offer resources from the Bishop's Conference and, and the Eucharistic Revival uh, that'll help you in your important role. And if there's resources that you'd uh, like to see or, or um, are looking for, please feel free uh, to check out the Eucharistic Revival website and make sure uh, to, to send uh, communication in so we can uh, know where you need help and try to find those experts like who we had today. But uh, again, thank you to everybody who's uh, joined today. And Father Dustin, maybe if you can bring us home with some prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Uh, for the great gift of uh, salvation in Christ. His death has destroyed our death, uh, and his resurrection has restored our life. Uh, that death and resurrection uh, has passed over into the sacraments. We thank you uh, for the Eucharist, uh, for that sacrament uh, through which uh, you build us up, build up your Christ, build up your church, May we join you in that work of building up. We pray as well to Our Lady, image and model of the church. May she, uh, the first uh, to uh, receive you incarnate, may she uh, be with us as mother Uh, that you may be born in us, in our communities, that we may be born in Christ. Uh, we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks so much, Father Dustin. Thanks, Robert, uh, and the Knights uh, for those wonderful resources. Again, all of which you can check out on the Eucharistic Revival website. And thanks again to Father Prince and Liz Father Grant and Father Han Hanley for uh, your guidance and leadership. And uh, again, we'll keep you in prayer as you uh, walk toward Corpus Christi and beyond. But have a great rest of your day. And thanks again uh, for all your service uh, out in our diocese, especially to help people uh, come to know Jesus in the Eucharist. Uh, we wish you well. God bless. <laughs>